Andy Panko, owner of Tenant Financial. Welcome to Retirement Planning Demystified. You may have heard of a health savings account, or HSA. As the name implies, a health savings account is a special type of account where you can contribute money to use to pay for qualified health care expenses. But did you know that HSAs are much more than just health care reimbursement accounts? They're actually the best retirement savings vehicles out there, and I'm about to explain why. If you like this video, please click the subscribe button below. But before we start, Remember this video is only general explanations and education. It's not specific tax, legal, or investment advice. Before considering acting on anything you see in this video, first consult with your tax, legal, or investment advisor. A health savings account, or HSA, is a special type of savings and investment account that the IRS has given preferential tax treatment to. Its purpose is to let you contribute money that can later be used to pay for qualifying healthcare expenses like medical insurance premiums, doctor co-pays and co-insurance, glasses, dental work, and so forth. However, there's no time limit on when you have to use the money in the account. Therefore, you can invest in an HSA potentially for decades to let it build up to then use it to pay for healthcare expenses while in retirement. Also, most HSAs let you invest in an assortment of traditional investments like mutual funds, which means you can get some really good growth over the long term. And the best part of an HSA is how favorable its tax treatment is. Let's take a look at that. Here's the four types of investment accounts you can use to save for retirement. A normal brokerage account, an individual retirement account or IRA, a Roth IRA, and an HSA. Let's start with how normal brokerage accounts are taxed. First, there's no tax benefit to making contributions to such accounts. You put money in that you've already paid tax on. In other words, there's no income tax deduction for making contributions. Once money is in the account, the growth may or may not be tax-free or tax-deferred. For example, if you own a municipal bond in a normal brokerage account, its interest payments will usually be tax-free. But if you own stock, any dividends you get during the year will be taxed. However, the tax on any gains in share price of stock will be deferred and not realized until you eventually sell the position. As for withdrawals, they also may or may not be taxable. As an example, if you sell a position for exactly the same price you paid for it, there will be no tax impact when you sell it and take the proceeds out. But if you sell a position at a gain, there will be tax owed. And if you sell a position at a loss, it can actually reduce your tax bill a bit. Let's now look at IRAs. The main benefit to IRAs is that you may be eligible for a tax deduction on your contributions. Furthermore, any growth within the account is tax deferred in that you don't have to pay any tax on the gains along the way. However, all distributions from an IRA are completely taxable at ordinary income tax rates. The opposite tax treatment of an IRA is a Roth IRA. Unlike with a traditional IRA, there is no deduction on your contributions to a Roth IRA. However, there will be no tax owed on gains as they accrue within the account. And then the big benefit of Roth IRAs is that all withdrawals will eventually be tax-free, assuming you meet some qualification criteria, which most commonly are met when you're at least 59 and a half years old and have had a Roth IRA for at least five years. Finally, let's look at the tax treatment of HSAs. Like IRAs, contributions are tax deductible. Also, gains are not taxable as they occur. And then like Roth IRAs, qualified withdrawals from HSAs are tax-free. In other words, HSAs are the only type of account that has a tax trifecta. No tax on the way in, no tax along the way, and no tax on the way out. Keep in mind this is just with regards to federal tax treatment. Each state could be a little different. Generally, most states piggyback off of federal tax rules, but at least two states, California and New Jersey, do not give HSAs any preferential tax treatment. They don't give you a state income tax deduction for contributions to HSAs, and they tax you on any gains you have in HSAs. In other words, California and New Jersey basically treat HSAs like normal brokerage accounts for state income tax purposes. Getting back to federal tax, there's actually one more potential tax benefit to HSAs. Let's also look at how HSAs can impact your payroll taxes, which are the Social Security and Medicare taxes you have to pay on your wages or self-employment income. With normal brokerage accounts, IRAs, and Roth IRAs, your contributions never reduce the amount of payroll taxes you have to pay. But with HSAs, if you have an HSA through your work, chances are your contributions will also reduce the amount of your earnings that are subject to payroll taxes. Now I said chances are because not all employer-sponsored HSA programs are eligible for this payroll tax deduction. Specifically, in order to be eligible, your HSA through your employer would need to be set up as part of your employer's Section 125 cafeteria plan. Now practically speaking, most employers do indeed set up their HSA programs that way, but not always. So, if you have an HSA through your employer, it's best just to ask them if your contributions will reduce your payroll taxes. As you can see, HSAs are the only account type that's 4 for 4 with green thumbs. 
That's what makes them such great investment vehicles for a tax efficiency perspective. So HSAs sound amazing so far, right? They are, but unfortunately not everyone can open one. In order to be eligible to open and contribute to an HSA, you need what's called a qualifying high deductible health plan. In other words, you need a certain type of health insurance to qualify, and only certain plans qualify. Specifically, the plan needs to meet special criteria, mainly a minimum level of deductible and a maximum limit on out-of-pocket expenses. Here's the qualifying limits for high deductible health plans for 2021. If you have an individual plan, which is a health insurance plan that only provides benefits for you and not other family members, the plan needs to have an annual deductible of no less than $1,400 and an annual out-of-pocket limit of no more than $7,000. If you have family coverage, which is a health insurance plan that covers you and at least one other person in your family, the minimum annual deductible is $2,800 and the maximum annual out-of-pocket limit is $14,000. Again, these limits are for 2021 only. It's important to know that these limits change a bit each year. And with regards to the maximum out-of-pocket limits, Note these limits exclude your monthly premium payments and also do not apply to expenses you pay for services from providers who are outside of your health insurance plan's network. If you do have a qualifying high deductible health plan, whether it's from health insurance you have through your employer or if you're unemployed or retired and bought private insurance on your own, you are eligible to open and contribute to an HSA. If you have health insurance through your employer, your employer will usually dictate which bank or custodian you need to use for your HSA account. But if you have your own insurance outside of an employer, you have a choice where you open your HSA. There are many HSA providers out there and they all have their pros and cons. Now this is not an endorsement of any particular providers, but the four largest HSA custodians by assets are Fidelity, Optum Bank, HSA Bank, and Health Equity. According to the National Association of Plan Advisors, these four providers accounted for 56% of all HSA assets outstanding as of June 2020. When shopping around for an HSA custodian, you want to use a provider who has good investment options, low fees, and quality account and customer service. So now let's assume you have a high deductible health plan and open up an HSA. You're probably now wondering how much you're allowed to contribute. The annual contribution limits are revised a little every year, but here's the limits for 2021. If you have an individual high deductible health plan that only covers you and you're younger than 55 by December 31st, 2021, you can contribute up to $3,600 for the whole year. If you have family coverage, you can contribute up to $7,200. If you'll be 55 or older by the end of 2021, you can make an additional catch-up contribution of $1,000, which means for individual coverage, you can contribute up to $4,600 to your HSA for the year. And then if you instead have family coverage, each you and your spouse can potentially make a $1,000 catch-up contribution, which means you could potentially contribute up to $9,200 for the year. If you have family coverage and only one of you has an HSA, then only the person with the HSA is eligible to make the additional catch-up contribution. However, if you're each 55 or older and each have your own HSA, even if you two are covered under the same family plan, you can each make the $1,000 additional catch-up contribution for 2021. With regards to these contribution limits, it's very important to know these limits are inclusive of any contributions you get from your employer. For example, if you have individual coverage and you're under 55, your annual contribution limit for 2021 is $3,600. If your employer contributes $2,000 to your HSA on your behalf, you'll then only be able to contribute $1,600 by yourself. You can't contribute the full $3,600 on top of whatever amount your employer puts in. It's also important to know that your annual contribution limits are prorated for the number of months in the year you have a qualifying high deductible health plan. For example, assume you have qualifying health insurance for only January, February, and March, and then you change insurance to a non-high deductible health plan. In this case, you'll only be eligible to contribute three twelfths or one quarter of your annual contribution limit because you will have had qualifying insurance for only three out of 12 months. However, if you start a qualifying high deductible health plan later in the year, you may be able to make your full annual contribution for that year. The IRS allows something called the last month rule. Under the last month rule, if you have qualifying high deductible health insurance for all of December, you're allowed to make the full annual contribution for that year, but you need to then maintain qualifying coverage for all of that December and the full 12 calendar months of the following year. If you don't, your contribution for this year will be retroactively prorated and some of it will be deemed ineligible after the fact. Which brings me to what happens if you contribute more to your HSA than you're allowed. Any amount of contribution above and beyond your eligible limit for the year will be subject to a 6% penalty. 
So be careful to pay attention to how many months in the year you have a qualifying high deductible health plan. And like I said, be aware of how much your employer is contributing to your HSA on your behalf because the total annual contribution limit is inclusive of your contributions and your employer's contributions. Once you have an HSA, you can keep it forever, which is what makes it such a valuable long-term retirement planning tool. But you can no longer contribute to your HSA if you don't have a qualifying high deductible health plan. For example, assume you have qualifying health coverage in your 30s and 40s, so you contribute to an HSA during those years. But then in your 50s, you switch jobs to an employer that doesn't offer any qualifying high deductible health plans. In that case, you can no longer contribute to your HSA, but you can still keep it nonetheless. And you can continue to keep your prior contributions invested so they can grow until you eventually use the funds during retirement. Which brings up an inevitable eligibility endpoint for almost everyone, Medicare. Medicare is unfortunately not considered a qualifying high deductible health plan. As you probably know, virtually everyone has to sign up for Medicare at some point, typically at age 65. That means you need to stop contributing to your HSA before the month you start Medicare. Let's take a look at this. Unless you're still working and have adequate health insurance through your employer, you need to sign up for Medicare starting in the month of your 65th birthday. Let's assume you turn 65 in April. This means you would typically start Medicare that April. And since Medicare is not a qualifying high deductible health plan, you would only potentially be eligible to contribute to your HSA from January through March. From April onward, you are no longer eligible for HSA contributions for those months. If you do contribute more than the three months worth of your annual contribution limit that year, you may have to pay the 6% excess contribution penalty. Let's look at a slightly different Medicare wrinkle that often catches people by surprise. In this scenario, you still turn 65 in April, but this time, assume you continue working past your 65th birthday and your employer continues to provide you qualifying high deductible health insurance up through retirement in July. Therefore, you don't actually have to sign up for Medicare until July, because you know you won't be signing up for Medicare until July, you think you're eligible to make HSA contributions up through June. Unfortunately, this is not the case. So don't do that. When you sign up for Medicare, your Part A coverage, which is the part that pays for inpatient hospital services, will be retroactively backdated up to six months or back to the month of your 65th birthday, whichever is less. In this example, when you sign up for Medicare in July, your Part A coverage will be retroactively started in April. That means you will have actually only been eligible to make HSA contributions through March. You will not be eligible to contribute from April onward. If you did make HSA contributions for April, May, and June, they'll be deemed ineligible. If you do make ineligible contributions, don't worry too much because you're able to undo them. Simply call up your HSA custodian and ask them how to go about taking out excess or ineligible contributions. It's thankfully a pretty standard process. But nonetheless, this is an important planning consideration for persons who continue to work past age 65. If you are contributing to an HSA while still working, you need to figure out when you plan on eventually starting Medicare and then stop your HSA contributions potentially up to six months prior to then. Before talking about the rules for getting money out of an HSA, I'd like to mention one more thing about HSA contributions. There's a special once in a lifetime type of contribution called a Qualified HSA Funding Distribution or QHFD. This is when you transfer money from your traditional tax deferred IRA to your HSA you can transfer up to your total annual HSA contribution limit this way. But you again have to keep in mind contributions from your employer. Even with a QHFD, your contribution is in conjunction with your employer's contribution and can't exceed your annual contribution limit. And like I said, you can only do a QHFD transfer once in your lifetime. So choose your timing and amount wisely. Also, you need to make sure you continue to have qualifying high deductible health insurance for at least 12 months after the month of your QHFD. If you don't, your QHFD will retroactively be deemed ineligible. In other words, you can't try to squeeze in a qualified HSA funding distribution the month before you drop your health insurance to start Medicare. Because remember, Medicare is not qualifying high deductible insurance. So plan accordingly and only do a QHFD when you're sure you'll continue having HSA eligible health insurance for at least a year after your transfer. If you are able to make a QHFD, it's a great way to save yourself some tax down the road because it lets you move a few thousand dollars from an IRA where all distributions will eventually be taxable to an HSA where all distributions could potentially be tax free. And that brings me to HSA distributions. Remember that I said taking money out of an HSA is usually a tax free event. However, that's only true if you take the money out to pay or reimburse yourself for qualifying medical expenses. Now, thankfully, most medical expenses are considered qualifying medical expenses. This includes medical insurance premiums, co-pays, co-insurance, glasses, hearing aids, 
surgical procedures, medical devices, and so forth. You can even use HSA money to pay for long-term care. As for Medicare, you can use an HSA to pay for the base monthly premiums for Medicare's Parts B and D, but you unfortunately cannot use an HSA to pay for premiums of a Medigap or supplemental insurance policy. Go figure. If you take an HSA distribution for anything other than a qualified medical expense, you will have to pay ordinary income tax on the amount of the distribution. Also, if you're under age 65 when you make an ineligible distribution, there will additionally be a 20% penalty on the amount withdrawn. So clearly you do not want to use HSA money for anything other than a qualified medical expense. Though if you're at least 65, the 20% penalty goes away and ineligible distributions will only be subject to regular income tax. Well, that's it for HSAs. I hope you found this helpful. As you can see, HSAs are incredibly valuable long-term retirement planning tools when used properly. In other words, it's often best to not fund an HSA to just turn around a few months later and take the money out to pay for current medical expenses. Instead, let the money sit and stay invested so you can really maximize its long-term growth and therefore maximize the amount of tax-free withdrawals you'll eventually be able to take out during retirement. If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel so you can be the first to know when new videos are posted. And don't forget to subscribe to my monthly newsletter, Retirement Planning Insights, which provides informative retirement planning tips and info. Also, be sure to join my free Facebook group, Taxes in Retirement, where you can learn all about tax-efficient retirement planning. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.